Good day, everyone. So, welcome again to our subject, Survey of English Literature. So, this is the lesson two of our recorded discussion. So, for today's discussion, we will talk about the Middle English. And um, in the succeeding presentation, you will encounter different stories and tales of Geoffrey Chaucer. And... I included the summary and the sentences of each stories, and you have to read it carefully. And I also included a short clip that will explain to you uh, what is the tale or story all about. So, um, if you have any questions regarding the stories and etc., again, you can leave it in our um, group chats. So, I hope you will enjoy reading and watching details of different tales of Geoffrey Chaucer. So let's now start with the Canterbury Tales. So let us now watch a short clip that will show you uh, what is the Canterbury Tales about. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer was written in the late 1300s, soon after the bubonic plague killed millions of people in England and throughout Europe. Chaucer was one of the first English poets to write in the vernacular of Middle English, popularizing the language of his day. The poem is a collection of 24 stories built around a frame narrative about a group of pilgrims making their journey to Canterbury. Chaucer's work addresses gender relations, religion, and sexual immorality within English society. He critiques members of the nobility, clergy, and peasantry who were often in conflict with each other and uses satire to call attention to the pilgrims' hypocrisy. Chaucer unveils the vast spectacle of human failings by exposing the pilgrims' preoccupation with worldly endeavors while on a religious pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral. The Canterbury Tales begins with the famous words, When April comes with his sweet, fragrant showers, which pierce the dry ground of March and bathe every root of every plant in sweet liquid, then people desire to go on pilgrimages. The narrator, who is meant to be a version of Chaucer himself, is staying at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, just outside the gates of London, when the company of 29 pilgrims descend. The inn's owner and host, Harry Bailey, sets up a challenge. Each pilgrim should tell four tales on their journey, two on the way to the shrine of martyr St. Thomas of Becket at Canterbury Cathedral, and two on their way back to London. The host will accompany them so he can judge the best story, and the other pilgrims will pay for the winter's supper upon their return. The narrator then introduces the pilgrims, starting with the knight, 
as the highest status and drew the shortest lot for the right to tell the first tale the knight is a chivalrous nobleman who has fought at the crusades in numerous countries in defense of christendom he is honored for his worthiness and courtesy the knight's fustian tunic made of coarse cloth has rust stains from his coat of chain mail the knight's son the squire accompanies him at twenty years old the squire is a lover and a lusty bachelor wearing clothes embroidered with red and white flowers he constantly sings or plays the flute and is the only pilgrim other than chaucer himself who explicitly has literary ambitions the yeoman or freeborn servant also travels with the knight clad in a coat and a hood of green he carries arrows made of peacock feathers a bracer or an arm guard a sword a buckler and a dagger as sharp as a spear he wears an image of saint christopher on his breast the narrator then moves on to the clergy the prioress called madame eglantine or mrs sweetbriar sweetly sings religious services speaks french and has excellent table manners she would weep if she saw a mouse caught in a trap and she has small dogs with her she wears a brooch with the inscription amor winket omnia love conquers all the prioress travels with the second nun who serves as her secretary as well as three priests the monk is next a modern man who prefers to hunt hare with his greyhounds rather than read books in a cloister the monk is well fed fat and his eyes gleam like a furnace in his head the friar and hubert is wanton and merry and is licensed to beg in certain districts franklins or landowners love him as do worthy women all over town he hears confession and gives absolution and is an excellent beggar the merchant wears a forked beard motley clothes and sits high upon his horse he gives his opinion solemnly and does excellent business never being in any debt but the narrator ominously remarks that he narrator doesn't know what other men think of the merchant next is the clerk a scholar of oxford university he would rather have twenty books by aristotle than rich clothes or musical instruments and thus is dressed in a threadbare short coat he only has a little gold which he spends on books and learning the man of law or sergeant of the law is judicious and dignified or at least seems to be no one can find a flaw in his legal writings despite his high standing the man of law rides in a homely multicolored coat a franklin travels with the man of law he has a beard as white as a daisy and is of the sanguine humor dominated by his blood he lives for culinary delight and his house is always full of meat pie fish and more meat the five guildsmen include a haberdasher carpenter weaver dyer and tapester representing an emerging middle class all of them are clothed in the same distinctive guildsman's dress none tells a tale roger the cook accompanies the five tradesmen to boil the chicken with marrow bones and spices for them but he also knows how to discern a good london ale he can also roast simmer boil fry stew and bake a good pie however it is a great pity that he has an ulcer on his shin a shipman from dartmouth is next tanned brown from the hot summer sun riding upon a cart horse and wearing a gown of coarse woolen cloth which reaches to his knees the shipman has many times drawn a secret draught of wine on board their ships while the merchant was asleep the shipman has weathered many storms and knows the locations of all the harbors from gotland to cape finisterre his ship is called the madeline a doctor of medicine is clad in red and blue 
and speaks with great authority about medicine and surgery. He knows the cause of every illness, what humor engenders them, and how to cure them. He is well read in the standard medical authorities, but has not studied the Bible. The wife of Bath, named Alice Solon, is a little deaf. She is adept at making cloth that surpasses even the cloth-making capitals of Chaucer's world, Ypres and Ghent. The wife of Bath wears linen coverings for her head, which the narrator assumes must weigh ten pounds. She has married five husbands in the church and has been to Jerusalem, Rome, and Boulogne on pilgrimage. She is gap-toothed and knows all the tricks of the trade when it comes to love. A good religious man, the parson of a town, is poor in goods, but rich in holiness. He travels on foot to visit all his parishioners, carrying a staff in his hand, calling them his sheep. A noble example to his flock, he acts first and preaches second. A plowman travels with the parson. He has hauled many cartloads of dung in his time, and is a good, hard-working man who lives in peace and charity. A miller comes next in this final group of pilgrims, those of the lowest social status. He always wins the prize in wrestling matches. He can lift any door off its hinges or break it by running at it head first. He has black, wide nostrils, carries a sword and a buckler or shield by his side, and has a mouth like a great furnace. He steals corn and takes payment for it three times, but then Chaucer implies there are no honest millers. Next is a noble manciple, a business agent, purchaser of religious provisions and a savvy financial operator trained in the law. The narrator ominously tells us that the manciple would deceive even a heap of learned men. The reeve is a slender, choleric man, long legs and lean. He knows exactly how much grain he has and is an excellent keeper of his granary. The reeve is an accountant who knows secrets about everyone, bailiffs, herdsmen, and servants, and all live in fear of him. The summoner is next, his face fire-red and pimpled, with narrow eyes. He has a skin disease across his black brows and his beard, which has hair falling out of it. He is lecherous. There is no cure to remove his pimples. He loves drinking wine and eating leeks, onions, and garlic. He summons people to appear in court. Traveling with the summoner is a noble pardoner his friend, and his companion, and the last pilgrim the narrator describes. He sings loudly, Come hither, love, to me, and has hair as yellow as wax. He carries a wallet full of fake pardons in his lap from Rome. With a thin, boyish voice, the partner is sexually ambiguous. Finally, Chaucer describes Harry Bailey as the outspoken and merry host of the Tabard Inn. He is large and bold, with bright eyes. Then the narrator concludes that he has told us now of the estate, or the class, the array, the clothing, and the number of pilgrims assembled in this company. Now their journey begins. The Canterbury Tip The Knight's Tale is a chivalric romance adapted from Giovanni Boccaccio's Tiseda, and is the first story in Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. Widely considered Chaucer's magnum opus, The Canterbury Tales was originally composed in Middle English between 1387 and 1400. The collection is comprised of 24 poems narrated as part of a storytelling contest between a group of pilgrims traveling from London to Canterbury to visit the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket. 
When the pilgrims draw lots to see who will tell the first tale, the knight, whom Chaucer describes as both a storied mercenary and a modest gentleman, is chosen. The principal characters in the knight's tale are cousins, Arcite and Palamon, who sacrifice their lifelong friendship to win the hand of the beautiful Emily. They seek victory through acts of chivalrous vainglory to marry the princess, which ends with tragic consequences for one of the knights. The poem opens with the story of Theseus, a duke returning to his native Athens after conquering the realm of the Amazons, formerly named Scythia, and marrying Hippolyta, an Amazonian queen. While bringing Hippolyta and her sister, Emily, back to Athens, Theseus encounters a group of women clad in black on the side of the highway near Thebes. The oldest of the women begs for Theseus's pity, saying that she was once the wife of King Capaneus, who was vanquished by Creon, the new ruler of Thebes. After conquering Thebes, Creon refused to bury the bodies of those slain in battle the very soldiers mourned now by the women on the road. Theseus orders his army towards Thebes, swearing vengeance on Creon and soon defeating him. While surveying the battlefield afterward, Theseus's men come upon two of Creon's knights, Arcite and Palamon, who are injured but not dead. Theseus sentences the young men to lifelong imprisonment in an Athenian tower. One day, after years of imprisonment, the knights spot Hippolyta's sister Emily picking flowers in a garden near the tower's window. Both men immediately fall in love with her. Over the years, the knights' friendship crumbles as they vie for her affection. Eventually, Arcite is freed with the help of his childhood friend Perotheus, a duke who happens to be visiting Athens. However, Theseus agrees to free Arcite on the condition that Arcite never steps foot in Athens again, tragically prohibiting him from courting Emily. After spending a year or two in Thebes, Arcite dreams that the god Mercury tells him to go to Athens and pursue Emily's love. He decides to do so in disguise, taking a job as a page in Emily's household. Under the name Philostrate, Arcite eventually earns the approval of Theseus himself, who makes him a squire of his chamber. Meanwhile, Palamon has been imprisoned for nearly seven years when he decides to escape from the tower and flee the city, intending to return in disguise, much like Arcite. With the help of a friend, Palamon escapes his jailer after spiking his spiced wine with narcotics and opium. Reaching a grove, Palamon comes upon Arcite riding his war horse. Arcite is talking to himself, and Palamon overhears him lamenting life without Emily's love. Still hidden, Palamon grows angry and leaps out to confront Arcite. Since neither is armed, the men vow to meet in the same place the next day and fight to the death for Emily. Both knights return, armed for battle, but they are interrupted by Theseus, Hippolyta, and Emily, who are out on a hunt. When Palamon reveals that he and Arcite are the formerly imprisoned knights, Theseus initially sentences them to death. But Hippolyta and Emily intervene, begging Theseus for mercy. Upon receiving their word never to wage war on Athens, Theseus decrees that the knights will compete for Emily's love in a duel, each armed with one hundred knights. The winner will marry Emily. The night before the duel, Palamon prays to a statue of Venus asking the goddess of love to make Emily his wife. When the statue shakes, Palamon interprets it as an omen that the goddess is listening. Meanwhile, Emily prays to Diana, goddess of chastity, to remain unmarried, adding that if it is her destiny to get married, 
she would prefer to marry someone who truly loves her. Finally, Arsete prays to the god of war, Mars, for victory in battle. In return, Mars whispers the word victory to him, a third omen. Chaos soon erupts in the heavens, with Mars and Venus waging war on each other. That is, until experienced Saturn offers a compromise, wherein Venus can help Palamon win his lady, and Mars can help Arsete win the battle. Theseus commissions a lavish stadium for the duel, and the day of the competition finally arrives. The two sides compete valiantly. But in the heat of battle, Palamon is accidentally wounded by a sword thrust. Theseus declares Arsete the winner, but before the knight can claim Emily as his prize, Pluto sends an earthquake that frightens Arsete's horse, causing him to throw the soldier to the ground, wounding his head. With his dying breaths, Arsete tells Emily that she should marry Palamon. And acknowledging the chivalric code of conduct, he admits that his wounded enemy is worthy of her love. Following a heroic funeral for Arsete, Emily indeed marries Palamon, fulfilling their three prayers. a landlord and gets very jealous when it comes to his wife. And here is also known as Tricky Nicky. He is an astronomy student and lives with John and his wife. Tricky Nicky has the hots for John's wife. And then there is Absalom. He is a young local priest and with all the women in town he desires John's wife. Look at that beauty, Allison. She is an 18 year old woman which is much younger than John. Truly, no man is worthy of her beauty. Here is the Miller's Tale. One week, John left his Kansas home due to carpenter duties. With John out of the house, Tricky Nicky was up to no good. Nicholas begged and begged to fulfill his desires for Allison, but Allison is not interested in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. 
But how could they be together, John being such a jealous man? Tricky Nikki knew just what to do, but it had to wait, because John was soon to return home. Absalom tried everything he could think of to get Allison to fall for him, but he never succeeded. Finally, it was time for Nicholas and Allison's plan. First, Nicholas hid away in his room. Let's see what happens next. Let Absalom heard that the carpenter had left his home, and he rushed to go see Allison and win her love. Tricky Nicky wanted to trick Absalom like Allison did, but the dog ran away. It was too late for Nicholas. He got burned. While Nicholas was screaming in pain, John arrived in the boat. He began to freak out about the flood. With all the commotion, his neighbors gathered around and made a fool of John. The Reeves Tale by Gregory Chaucer, interpreted by Lilian Santa Cruz, Ana Huerta, Patricia Ruiz, and Alejandra Davalos. There once was a miller whose name was Simkin. He had a water mill near the Cambridge Solar Hall College. He was a mean and dishonest person who had a lot of confidence, and he also had the ability to trick people to steal their corn and flour. 
The miller had a wife who was a very decent and respectable woman. One man bothered to flirt with her because the miller was a very jealous man. The couple had a 20-year-old daughter and a little baby. And so the story begins. One day, the college principal got sick, and the two students, Alan and John, asked if they could take the corn to the miller and have it ground. They promised that they would watch the miller to avoid him stealing their flour, since this was something that the miller would do with almost anyone that he came across with. The Monsipal accepted, and Alan immediately went to put the sack on the horse, and both students rode away. When they arrived, the miller asked them why they were there. And they answered him that their manciple was sick and that they wanted their head to gain the corn. The miller agreed and asked them what they would do in the meantime. And John answered they would stay right there with him. The miller knew that they wanted to be watching him. So he smiled and thought. For every trick... Each clever they make, the more that I can steal, the more that I can take. Instead of flour, I will give them brand. The greatest scholar is not the whitest man. To distract the students, he secretly went to untie their horse. And when the horse was loose, it ran towards the fence. Once the corn was ground and sacked, John went to look for the horse, only to find out that it had escaped. A horse is lost! Come, Alan! Get on your feet! The student forgot about the flower and ran to look for the horse. When the miller saw that they were busy looking for their horse, he immediately went to steal their flower. When Alan and John finally rescued their horse and went back, they realized that the miller had tricked them to steal their flower. It was already night, so the students asked the miller if they could spend the night at his house, and of course, pay him. The miller, thinking of all the money he could make, he joyfully agreed. The students also asked the miller for food and drinks, and offered to pay that as well. They were drinking and eating the whole night until the miller got drunk, and finally, they went to bed at midnight. John and Alan couldn't sleep at all. Then Alan told John, In revenge for the corn the miller stole from us, I should sleep with his daughter. John warned him not to wake the miller, but Alan didn't care for his advice and carried on straight to the daughter's bed, where he quickly achieved his purpose. John also decided to play along, to play a trick on the miller's wife. He took the baby's foot from the foot of the miller's bed and placed it on the foot of his own bed. 
This would confuse the miller's wife. Shortly after this, the miller's wife woke up to go to the bathroom. Coming back into the bedroom, she felt around the dark, looking for the baby's crib, which was now at the foot of John's bed. She climbed into the bed, and John also achieved his purpose. At dawn, when Alan tries to return to his bed, the misplacement of the baby's crib causes him to jump into bed with the miller. Alan whispers, Hey John, guess what? I was in bed with the miller's daughter the whole night. Furious, the miller rises out of the bed and punches Alan in the nose. How dare you, he says. Because of the noise, the wife wakes up. She tries to break up the fight, but she hits her husband, thinking is one of the scholars. And so the miller takes a beating and loses his grinding feet for all of his cheating. John and Alan take their horse and flower without delay and ride away. And as to the end of this tale, the miller's wife was screwed, his daughter too. That's how it is for the millers who are not true. And as for the proverb at the end of this tale, one who does evil should not expect good. The end. to hear the miller pickled, laughed like a man whose back was being tickled. Ha ha, he roared. Ha ha, Christ's blessed passion. That miller was paid out in proper fashion. <coughs> For trying to argue that his house was small, be careful who you bring into your hall, says Solomon in Ecclesiasticus. For guests who stay the night are dangerous. A man can't be too careful when he brings a stranger in among his private things. May the Lord send me misery and care, if ever since they called me the Hodge of Ware. I heard a miller scored off so completely that just of malice in the dark came neatly. But God forbid that we should stop at that, so if you'll condescend to hear my chat, I'll tell a tale, though only a poor man, but I'll do the very best I can. A little joke that happened in our city. Well, said our host, let it be good and witty. Now tell on, Roger, for words with you. You've stolen gravy out of many a stew. Many the jack of Dover you have sold, that has been twice warmed up and twice left cold. Many a pilgrim's cursed you more than sparsely, when suffering the effects of your stale parsley, which they had eaten with your stubble-fed goose. Your shop is one where many a fly is loose. Tell on, my gentle Roger, and I beg. You won't be angry if I pull your leg. Many a true word that has been said in jest. That's sure enough, said Roger. For the rest, true jest, bad jest, is what the Flemings say. And therefore, Harry Bailey, don't give way to temper either, if I have a plan to tell a tale about a publican before we part. Still, I won't tell it yet. I'll wait until we part to pay my debt. And then he laughed and brightened up a bit, and he began his story. This was it. There was a prentice living in our town, worked in the victualling trade, and he was brown. Brown as a berry, spruce and short he stood, as gallant as a golden finch in the wood. 
Black were his locks, and combed with fetching skill. He danced so merrily, such a will, that he was known as reveling Peterkin. He was as full of love, as full of sin, as hives are full of honey, and as sweet, lucky the wench that Peter chanced to meet. At every wedding he would sing and hop, and he preferred the tavern to the shop. Give me a cheeseburger. Whenever any pageant or procession came down Cheapside, I call it the cannon. Goodbye to his profession. He'd leap out of the shop to see the sight and join the dance and not come back that night. He gathered round him many of his sort and made a gang for dancing, song, and, and sport. To make appointments where to meet for playing dice in such and such a street. And no apprentice had a touch so nice as Peter when it came to casting dice. Yet he was generous and freely spent certain secret places where he went. Of this his master soon became aware. Many a time he found the till was bare. For an apprentice that's a reveler, with music, riot, dance, and paramour, will surely cost his shop and master dear, though little music will his master hear. Riot and theft can interchange, and are convertible by fiddle and guitar. Play the best song in the world. Rivals and honesty among the poor are pretty soon at strife, you may be sure. This jolly apprentice, so the matter stood, till nearly out of his apprenticehood, stayed in his job, was scolded without fail, <coughs> and sometimes led with minstrelsy to jail. Cranky! Old Peter kids being dragged off to jail! Ha <laughs> ha! But in the end, his master, was taking thought, while casting up what he had sold and bought, hit on a proverb, as he sat and poured, throw out a rotten apple from the hoard, or it will rot the others. Thus it ran. So, with a ride a servant, sack the man, or he'll corrupt all others in the place, far wiser to dismiss him in disgrace. The master then gave Peterkin the sack. With curses, don't come here again, and forbade him to come back. And so this jolly apprentice left his shop. Now let him revel all night, or stop. As there's no thief but has pal or plucker to help him lay waste or melt the sucker, from whom he borrows cash or steals instead, Peter sent round his bundle and his bed to a young fellow of the self same sport, equally fond of reveling dice and sport. His wife kept shop to save her good repute, but earned her living as a prostitute. I think you know page it's on. 120. Right. So are we going to have uh, both of us read? Stupid word. Don't make up words for your stupid rhymes game. <laughs> okay, so um, do you want me to be the narrator and the host, or do you want to be the cook and I say because the cook. And that's all for today's discussion. So this the this discussion lesson to part one will be uh will have part two because uh Geoffrey Chaucer has many tales and stories to be told. So for your performance activity, answer the following questions. This consists of I mean this consists of sixty points. Put your answer in the comment section below by following the format. Your name, your cluster, and your answer, and the deadline would be on December 10, 2023, 8 p.m. only. So sorry, for your performance activity, 
Um, journal entries, the narrator writes that many pilgrims enjoyed the night's tale, but the miller would be interrupts to tell his own story. So your task here is to write a journal entry as a pilgrim in the Canterbury Tales. Rewrite what happens in the miller's prologue from your own point of view, commenting on your own opinion of the miller and also the other characters' of reactions. You may choose to express positive or negative feelings towards the miller, but you cannot add major events which are not already in the text. So your entry should include reference to your occupation, use teacher and as occupation, and your personal opinion about the night's tale and your opinion about the miller's response. So your observation, you also include your observations on how others are responding to the miller and whether or not you agree with them. So we have provided a sample beginning for your journal entry. Feel free to use it or start your own. Use the sample below as your basis of your introduction. So this is the example. So again, thank you very much for watching. So I hope you will read and you will um, understand the story of the tales of uh, Jeffrey Chosers. So thank you very much and see you on the lesson two part three.